this time. If we look at the current situation in the world, especially post-COVID, the eradication of the middle class throughout the globe, the, the compelling and the move to digital countries and control, the, the compelling move for a greater control of populace, what message do you have for citizens of the world about what is happening right now? We've all seen videos of the 15-minute cities. We've all seen videos of higher social control, utilizing currency as a means of control of the masses. What do you see happening, both from your, 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 your residency within the United States, because there's a lot of discussion that are happening within the U.S. about this move to this digital currency, which is almost being rewritten without the American public having any involvement. It's done at central bank level and just being implemented. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what we have in uh, the pace-setting world of uh, future plans and strategies is that those some people refer to them as the deep state. And um, the more the power structure is um, visible, the least visible these deep state actors are. <clears throat> and here's where we have the confluence of the corporate world with the, with the official world they find common purpose among them. And it seems like in their, um, in their coordination meetings, uh, which of course are not made public and uh, no one knows about them except them, um, I think they've reached a decision in which they, uh, in one way or the other, want to depopulate the world. It's basically a culture of death. Uh, and you can see it being played out, uh, beginning with uh, contraception, uh, going on to abortion, continuing on from there to the sexual mayhem that we have, uh, with this LGBTQ uh, non-productive, uh, non-reproductive relationship between the sexes uh, through the wars that are being launched. And now we have this new uh, chapter, uh, and that is uh, health warfare, uh, medical warfare. Uh, I think COVID is probably a dry run for other equivalent and such uh, pandemics. Uh, they even begin to uh, release some words and some statements that are beginning to prepare the public for what is coming. Uh, they say that there's a new variant of COVID that's going to appear, and there's some other new type of pandemic that is probably going to hit humanity uh, in the year 2025. That's about two years from now. So when you, when you begin to put the pieces of, and then you have the control of currency, uh, there are horror scenarios now. Today is the 20th of May, uh, and in another 12 days, if the U.S. Congress does not agree to raise the ceiling of its debt, then it is going to default. And that would mean that not only is the dollar suffering from self-inflicted wounds of sanctioning other countries in the world, forcing them into their own independent political blocks, but it also means the devaluation of the dollar within the United States and within the dollarized uh, countries of the world. It, it, and then you have the, for the first time uh, in U.S. history, 
if a person has $10,000, let's say, or $100,000 deposited in a certain bank, and he goes to the bank and he says, I want to withdraw, uh, if I have $1,000, 100000 I want to withdraw $9,000 from my account. For the first time, the bank is telling the depositor, we can only give you $2,000. Uh, as, as far as I know, this has happened in two or three banks in the United States. Add to that the failure of banks in the United States. You heard about the Silicon Valley Bank that went under, and another bank on the East Coast that went under, and of course, those who are in charge are assuring the public that everything is fine, there's nothing to panic about, and this issue will be solved. Uh, and politicians have to say this because they want to stay in office. But the trend, the trend is in a direction that uh, they want to kill off, uh, and they could use also the conflict in the Ukraine to kill off. I mean, when we speak about criminals, we're speaking here about high class criminals. It doesn't pinch their conscience if they, if the pop, if world population is eight billion. To them, uh, well, killing off six billion eh, sounds more doable. Let's aim for killing off six billion people in the world. This is how the internal criminal thoughts are developing, and there is a certain. A core element to this deep state, and if I'm not asked about it, I'm not going to uh, divulge it, but uh, that core element is uh, looking after a particular nation state in the world, and if the whole world goes to hell, and that particular nation state survives, uh, they've uh, achieved a victory. And I think this is the way things are going. Imam, if we if we look at the the current revelations coming out of corporate America, the corporate world, its control of people, I'd like to take us back in history right now. And if we, I don't know, uh, and I know you've got a strong depth of knowledge, but maybe tell us a little bit about the Khazars their location, their move to become uh, Jews, uh, be confronted by the Christians and the Muslims on either sides of the regions that they were, and who they have now become in the global play and their relationship with Israel. Yeah, this uh, question uh, would take us into an area in which the mainstream media has tried to has tried its best in all of these years to marginalize. They don't want people to think uh, straight on this issue. But now that you ask the question, uh, I mean, it can take a lot of time to answer this, but I'll I'll try to do my best in the circumstance that I'm in. Um, the Jewish religion is not a proselytizing religion. I think everyone knows that. And so there comes, because they suffer from a dwindling of their own population. So that happened some hundreds of years ago. They, um, the Jewish rabbis uh, wanted an influx of uh, more people into their religion. So one area that they were very successful in, or at least relatively successful in, was the Khazar area, uh, which is north of the Caspian Sea and towards Eastern Europe. Uh, they managed to have a mass conversion of people into the 
Judaic religion. And then they closed that off. No one else from now on. Now we have enough people, we have enough new blood, and we have enough reproductive capacity right now, so we don't have to worry about anything else. Um, it just happens, Allah's calculations, that the war in the Ukraine is related to the conversion of non-Jews to Judaism in the Khazar. And one take on this is that the Israelis who are controlling Palestine, they think that if they are beginning to lose their battle in Palestine, then their retreat would be to that area, the, the Ukraine. That uh, they think they will uh, have as a backup homeland, so to speak. Um, I want to bring to your attention the fact that <clears throat> there's a there's a very deep history to all of this. And that is uh, Christianity, or Christendom. Uh, there are three major factions or religious groupings in, under that broad title of Christendom. There is the Eastern Orthodox Christians, and then there is the Catholic Christians, and there is, then there's the Protestant Christians. Uh, the Protestant Christians were the most friendly to the Jewish population in Europe. Uh, they are so fond of the Jews that they adopt Jewish names and they also are the engine of the evangelical movement in the United States. And they have absolved the Jews of the crucifixion. Uh, even though there are certain maybe intellectuals or certain researchers uh, that adhere to one of the Protestant denominations who do not agree with the uh, cordiality, the theological, historical uh, co-understanding between Jews and Protestants. The Catholics have held the belief that the Jews, it was a Sanhedrin, uh, in the time of Jesus that was championing the execution of Jesus. And so they said, uh, as long as the Jews, the current Jews, in our time, in our generation, as long as they do not condemn what the Jews did at that time concerning the crucifixion of Jesus, then we hold them accountable. Then comes one of the popes in the 1960s and he absolves the Jews of the blood or of deicide. And so there has been uh, a type of uh, management of the Vatican and the Catholics of the world. I had the opportunity to uh, have at least a couple of in-depth discussions with some of these Catholics who are very well versed. One of them is a Catholic, uh, uh, I think he has become a cardinal now, but before that he, he was um, working his way uh, towards that, uh, rank, and he divulged to me the fact, and this was uh, 
it was almost uh, over 30 years ago, that he said to me in confidence, of course, of course, I'm not saying his name, I'm not giving you any other information about this because, you know, he spoke to me in confidence. He said, it's a well-known fact among us uh, in the Catholic Church that the Zionists have virtually taken control of the papacy. And, but we can't say this out loud. We can't go public with it. We, we, just, we just have to live with it. It's not what we want. It's not our choice. But we just have to live with it. Another one of these very intellectual Catholics who we've exchanged some ideas about this whole affair, uh, he also concedes that the Catholic Church has genuflected in the altar of Zionism, just putting it in some poetic words. The only Christians that have not gone the Protestant and the Catholic way are the Eastern Orthodox. The Eastern Orthodox Christ Christians are geographically located in Russia and Eastern Europe in those territories that were originally Khazar lands. They still maintain uh, that the Jews, and they don't call them Zionists or Israelis, that the Jews were involved in the crucifixion, quote unquote, of Lord Jesus Christ. And is it perchance, ask yourself today, is it perchance that this war that is going on in the Ukraine is a war by, you know, I'm breaking loose from all the political terminology, putting it in another dimension. It is a war on one side between the Eastern Orthodox Christians and what they think about their own history dating back to uh, 2,000 years ago in the life of Jesus on one side and those who are uh, of the Protestant and Catholic denominations who are very protective of Israel and Zionism on the other side. In this mix of things uh, would you think that there is a type of common purpose at that level between Muslims and the Eastern Orthodox Christians given what we have in today's world? And given uh, Zelensky, who is the president of uh, the Ukraine, is a Jew. The movers and shakers in Washington when it comes to uh, foreign policy and to economics are Jews. Not to mention their disproportionate influence in other uh, governmental uh, departments. Uh, and then all of this money, hundreds of billions of dollars going from the U.S. to the Ukraine at a time when People in the U.S. need this money. This is the, the Americans' tax paid dollars that are being given to support a war in the Ukraine in which there are no vital uh, American national interests. Anyone who has any, I, any knowledge of what the Ukraine means to the U.S. will tell you, what are we doing in this war? Why are we sending hundreds of billions of dollars and military uh, hardware along with some mercenaries? Why are we sending all of this when we need this money in our own country? The number of homeless people in the United States is increasing drastically. The health system is beginning to show uh, symptoms of serious failures. 
the Medicare, uh, the budget of Medicare is going to run out in another 10 or 12 years. And so the elderly in the United States are no longer going to have uh, health protection, uh, along with the Social Security payments that are paid to the retirees and the elderly in the United States. All of these budgets are being strained and in peril. Because of what? Because of a nation state that uh, claims that it has biblical rights to another people's country. And as I said, this question can take me in many directions, but <laughs> I'll end it with that. I'm not going to let you into that. I'm going to push you a little bit harder. Okay. So, so, so talk to me about the Ashkenazi, which is a particular grouping of Jews, and which of the tribes they belong to. Yeah, you take me into an area in which the Jew himself cannot define who a Jew is. When, when they begin this self-centeredness among themselves, then they begin a, uh, an internal, uh, psychological, social, political polarization among themselves. Um, and this is what happens. It will happen within a religion. It will happen within a, um, a political orientation. It can happen anywhere. But in this case, it happens among the Jews. On one level, they consider themselves of two origins or two racial classifications, the Ashkenazis and the Sephardim. One of them is like, to bring it closer to our understanding, one of them is like a Euro-Jew and the other one is like an Oriental or an Eastern Jew. And uh, the makeup of the uh, illegitimate state of Israel uh, is a type of control by the Euro-Jew over the Jew who comes from the East. Uh, just when, next time you're looking at these decision makers inside Israel, uh, whether it's Netanyahu or whether it is uh, another prime minister preceding him, members of their own Knesset, their own parliament, uh, look at their racial makeup. Uh, you will be hard pressed to find one, one Jew who is of uh, sub Saharan origin. There are many Jews in Israel from Ethiopia in particular, and others from uh, different areas uh, around Ethiopia. Uh, even from Yemen. Look at the makeup, the racial makeup. I'm sorry to say this, I mean, but this is their internal way of thinking of themselves. Do you see anyone who comes from that racial background in the upper echelons of their government? No. I can comfortably tell you, you will not see one. And if you are going to see one in the coming year or in the coming decade, it's for cosmetic purposes. They want you to believe that, you know, we are all together in this, whether we are Ashkenazi or whether we are Safadi. Um, we are all one, but in fact they are not. Tahsabuhum jami'an wa kulubuhum shatta. The ayah in the Quran says you will think that they are a consolidated whole, but no, their hearts are dispersed and separated from each other. Uh, now that's at one level, and we all know the, I hope, uh, we know of the incident uh, about a decade or so ago, maybe a little more than that, when there was a drive for uh, donating blood in, uh, in Israel. 
and uh, the hospitals would not take blood from Ethiopian Jews. And they justified that, of course, along racist uh, lines of thinking. And then you come to uh, the, uh, the class differentiations inside the country. And once again, you will find those who are in the upper crust of the economic and financial class in Europe to be of European origin. And the uh, lower class, the underclass, comes from the continents of Africa and Asia. And then in their, uh, in their religious classification of themselves, you have uh, the secular Jews and the atheist Jews. The, the interesting element here is how do you continue to call yourself a Jew when you're an atheist? But they have developed a racial or a racist definition of who a Jew is that trumps the religious definition of, a, of who a Jew is. Because to be a Jew, you have to be a racial Jew and a religious Jew. So if you annul your religious character, meaning you're no longer a believing Jew, you still have your racial character that identifies you as a Jew. So that racial character of the European Jew, even though he's an atheist or a secular, still qualifies him to be a more qualified or a more meritorious Jew than another who is of African or Asian origin, who is a believing Jew, who is a conservative Jew, and who is an orthodox Jew. How do you, how do you come to terms with these contradictions? Their uh, population makeup is so uh, confusing that among this Jewish population, there are Jews who, in their interpretation of the Torah and of the Talmud and of their own history, they are opposed to the state of Israel. Not all Jews in the world support the state of Israel. There are religious Jews who are against the state of Israel based upon their deep understanding of their history and of their religious sources. And then there are secular atheist Jews, most of them are to be found on the political left, who are also against the state of Israel. But the question is here is, how far are they against the state of Israel? Are they against the state of Israel that is in control of the West Bank and Gaza and the Golan Heights? So if Israel gives up the West Bank and Gaza and the Golan Heights, then they are comfortable with that, then they recognize Israel? Or are they against the whole Israeli project from the river to the sea? And here you'll find some here and some there. And then you have the, a portion of the Jews who are on, on religious basis. They are against the state of Israel from beginning to end. From 1947 until this very day, all of it, they are against having a uh, a state until, in their belief, until the coming of the Messiah. 
Short of that, there can be no legitimacy given to any state that calls itself Israel. So uh, this Ashkenazi and this Sephardim categorization of the Jewish people, it is one serious level of understanding the dynamics inside the, uh, the Jewish uh, house, as it were. But as I explained, there are many other uh, fissures in the Jewish population, and it's extremely dangerous to generalize. The, the state of Israel wants to generalize and say all Jews in all the world are Israelis. They could be living in the United States, they could be living in South Africa, in Australia, in any other place. They are, what, they are, if they land in Israel, they set foot and they go to the appropriate ministry and apply for citizenship immediately because they are Jews, they are given Israeli citizenship. Uh, but the truth has to be honored. A minority of Jews, some of them religious, some of them secular, are against the state of Israel. Some of them are just, especially in our time now, especially the younger generation, is as confused as ever among them. In the United States, they're beginning to distance themselves from Israel always being right and doing the right thing. And then, obviously, the, the diehard Zionists who believe Israel uh, is always uh, on the right side of the issues. It can do no wrong. Israel is impeccable. It is faultless. And anyone who dare point out the atrocities and the crimes against humanity, the war crimes, the racism, it, by Israel, in Israel, for Israel, with Israel, anyone who dare point at that and then all of a sudden they throw the, uh, the tag of anti-Semitism against that type of person. And if a person happens to be a Jew, they'll say he's a self-hating Jew. So this is the real world we are in. Zakala. I think we've covered a very diverse, I'll cut that up into the right you know little to, areas that, that need you know to be spoken about. I had to push that not so much from a um, mainstream perspective, but more from a, we have to have social media these days. So yeah, yeah. nice, cut ups, TikTok. Yeah. That can oh, be nice. one minute is. Do you get that's why I've had you talk to I know how we'll slice this. It will be sliced good. down the line. Very good, very good. So there's certain elements that work for above the line. Yeah. There's other elements that work for yeah. for for thought provocation. Yeah. Well you're on top of it. Thank you so much. You're far from it. And, and we, oh, no, no. no. And when you do uh, have these uh, let me share them, with you. Uh, let's call them sound bites. When you do have these out in the social media. Can you pass them on also to me? You'll first receive them Thank you, before sir. they make the public, inshallah. Wow. You know why? It's important for you to confirm because when we cut, yeah. I don't want to lose the essence yeah. of what has been discussed. Sure. So I will personally want to send them to you. Sure. Once you've approved, we will then okay. start utilizing multiple okay. social accounts to okay. push it out. You have my word. Whenever it comes to me, I will affirm I received it. Ready to go. Brilliant. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Then we're okay. Because I need you to make sure that the message is not tainted yeah. after the cuts. Okay. Do you, you, you get me? Yeah, yeah. And at the same time, I also don't want, because, you know, a lot of the discussion could have come across as though Muslims and Jews have a problem, or Muslims and Christians have a problem. Mm -hmm. That couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah, exactly. That couldn't be further from the truth. We have no difficulty with believing Jews, Christians across the board. The Israeli situation is a political situation that has got very little to do with religion. Bravo. Well, that's one you reminded me. That's one of the points I mentioned a couple of times. 
Um, I said to some of these Muslim crowds in Cape Town, I think once, and here, I said, I want to pose a question to you. What is it that has us as Muslims in war with the Jews when we say, I'm speaking at the theological level, أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله. That's us, the Muslims, right? In a nutshell, article of faith. Now we go to the Jew, who we don't know much about, and all of this stuff in the air about them. But what do they say on the theological level? They say in their own language, Hebrew, Arabic, أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن موسى رسول الله. That's them. So do we have any theological argument to fight against them? No. When they are the closest to us theologically? No. So there has to be another issue that we have to begin to mentalize, to understand why they have become this enemy when this is what they say. And why, in another sense of the word, we have become similar to them. This has to be worked out. So, you know, <laughs> sometimes I've never heard something like this in my life. <laughs> Anyways. No, but you see, I think if when we have the chance, jumping into, remember, most of the Jewish tribes moved to Medina. Badu Nadir, Badu Kainuka. I mean, they were all there. But one has to dig deep into their rejection at the time because the, the scriptures spoke of the next prophet coming from that land. But when Rasulullah came, because he didn't come from their own, yeah. they click. So we have to delve back into Syria, yeah. delve back into that point at which the eye to eye was not seen. And then turning back to Quran, where Quran says clearly that they know better than you. Exactly. Better exactly. than you. Exactly. So, so we need to, and, and in this world of hatred, INX is coming across as saying, we're sick and tired of the hatred. We're sick and tired of the judgment in terms of each of us that we are now radicalizing and partitioning and using religion as well as a myriad of other factors to compartmentalize us into tiny little groupings. We saying by and large the masses out there are the same. By and large we all need to unite and come together. How we refer to our creator is amongst us. This is not a theological discussion about who's right and who's wrong. But this is the high time that the multitude of the masses that are suffering the same plights come together holding hands and say, what is it that's going to connect us back? So before you leave, give us one connecting point that brings us together, specifically the Abrahamic faith. Justice. That's the key word. Justice. We, as... Uh Muslims, or we as um, followers of Scripture, the history of Scripture and the history of prophets centered around social justice. And this, ha this has to come out very clear. You know, in today's world, when someone says Islam because of the, the hypnosis of the mainstream media, when someone says Islam, the person hearing that, what comes to their mind is terrorism. When someone says Muslim, then that is synonymous with terrorist. That's the type of public mind that's out there. Our, if we were, if we understood our mission, our Quran, our prophet, we would make sim we would make justice and social justice synonymous with Islam. So when a person says, someone says Islam, what comes to the public mind is social justice. When someone says Muslim, what comes to mind is a seeker of social justice. Look, see how far the transition is? How to penetrate that public mind and convince them that Islam is justice-centered, justice-oriented, and justice-seeking. This is what Islam is all about. 
In the ayah in the Quran, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُولَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَنْزَلْنَا مَعَهُمْ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانِ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْتِ So that people, our message is that people in the world, regardless of their religion, their background, their persuasions, their, so that people enjoy or live by the standards of social justice. I love it. But Sheikh, I want to say one thing to you. The world has had two sides with regards to Islam. The one is the propaganda machine that was out there. But we one has to just look at what Muslim rulers, post-colonization, post the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, have created for a feeling of Muslim rulership and social justice. One looks at, 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 at each of the, the, the fragments of the Ottoman society that were now created as nation states across the globe. What does that leadership speak about social justice? I think they're empty-headed about it. All of the leadership that we have in our Muslim countries have no relationship to a policy or a strategy that fulfills the requirements of social justice. None of them have that. I mean, Iran, in a sense, has its back and forth with all of this issue in a sincere attempt to do something along those lines. But with that possible exception, all the rest are just, what are you talking about? They tell you when you, when you uh, speak to them about Islam, they say Islam is a religion. Why get Islam involved in these other issues? See, their understanding of Islam is exactly what the understanding of the, of the enemies of the Muslims is about Islam. That's why in many of these presentations I said, in order for us to liberate what has been taken away from us, whether it's our lands, whether it's our resources, whether it is directly, militarily, economically, diplomatic, whatever. A lot of things that we've been dispossessed of what belongs to us. The, f the first step in regaining our rights to recover what belongs to us, the first step is for us to liberate our minds. They have, they have gone our, these same people who are stealing us dry, they have gone inside our minds and they've switched off that important terminology that connects us with the Qur'an. So the, the activists, the functional words of the, of the Qur'an have become passive, have become reactionary, have become status quo. How are we going to move forward when our, when our own understanding is a misunderstanding of who we are. It, it, it will never happen. 